um, about 300 BC, people were creating rock art. And for the people living in Kabaten at this time, this form, this particular form of monument seems to have been very important to them. There's an extraordinary concentration of rock art in and around the Glen, and some of Britain's most important sites and most, most complex sites are, are found here. Um, this is the site um, of Ormeg, uh, and it's also one of Aaron Watson's photos. Uh, sorry, I should say Aaron works for us as interpretation and engagement manager, and he's an archaeologist, artist, um, and as you'll see, uh, a very good photographer. So we have some of the most extensive sites um, in Cromartin. This is Aknebrek, um, and it's of a particular, all of the rock art in Cromartin, the Cup and Ring Mark rock art, is a, known as Atlantic rock art, which has a um, motif palette, uh, cups and um, cup marks sometimes, sometimes cups and rings, uh, lines, grooves, and is part of a tradition that broadly is distributed across northern and western Britain, down the Atlantic seaboard into uh, France, Spain, and Portugal. Um, I, I should say, I'm not going to talk any more about rock art. I know it's a really fascinating subject, but if you are interested in it, we've got um, some talks available on the museum's YouTube uh, channel. Um, one particular one by um, Erin, which focuses um, specifically on um, Aknebrek and also on some new research that Erin has been doing, which has revealed some really interesting things. Um, about these sites. They're much more complex than we first thought, um, or we might have thought previously. So also um, of Neolithic origin is the ritual monument at Temple Wood, um, which is, is a really complicated um, monument. First of all, it started off as a timber circle um, at the site of the Northeast Circle. And then it seems to have been replaced um, by a partial stone circle. So you see, before metal came to be used in, in Scotland, the Glen was also already a very significant ritual landscape. Um, so here's, here's a picture of um, shiny metal things, just because I thought you, you, by now you probably want to see, see something. Um, and this is uh, a flat axe, a, um, a, a bronze, a copper um, flat axe. It's, it's actually a replica. But what I wanted to show you a replica, which I want you to see um, just how, how kind of amazing and, and shiny these things um, were when they're, when they're first made. And <clears throat> if you imagine uh, being a prehistoric person and having never seen metal before, um, this would kind of blow your mind, I think. So the, most of you might be familiar with the terms Neolithic and Bronze Age, but probably less familiar um, you, you, uh, with the term Chalcolithic, maybe, or Copper Age. So between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, there's a, a period of around about 300 years in Scotland of um, where copper's in use, but bronze isn't. So we um, bronze we we have we have to call this a chal the Chalcolithic or the or the Copper Age, although it's it's not been particularly fashionable amongst archaeological archaeologists to call it that in in Britain. Um, so now I just wanted to explore a little bit about how the knowledge of metal came to um, Carmarthen Glen. So some of you might know this story already, but um, it, it, around about 2500 BC, archaeologists start to find evidence of, of gold and copper um, in use in, in certain areas in Britain. And it tends to focus in its early stages around uh, ritual landscapes. Um, this is also the case in Carmarthen. We... And this is really how, how on earth did the knowledge of tools, technology, uh, the, you know, the knowledge, the tools, the technology to transform um, lumps of seemingly dull material into um, shiny, spectacular and, and frankly dangerous artefacts. How, how, did that, how did that come to Scotland? Well, researchers that have been working on this period now think it was probably brought by immigrants, um, which you, you might have heard um, called the Beaker people. Um, there's been an awful lot of research um, using the latest scientific techniques um, around beaker people of, of late. And there's a brilliant book by um, Mike Parker Pearson et al. Um, that, that is a, the culmination of that enormous research project. And archaeologists understand beaker culture, not, not just to be about, um, about pots, of which this is, this is a beaker pot uh, in, in situ, um, having, having been discovered by excavation. Um, it's, it's also uh, a complex cultural, ideological and um, social phenomena, which involves 
metal work, um, first gold and copper and then later bronze. Um, I should say bronze is an alloy of copper and tin. Um, it also involves uh, specific types of orientation in, expressed in grave goods, gender specific rules regarding burial, um, to all indicates a shared ideology, culture and beliefs. And we now know through the Beaker People research that this period does represent an absolutely remarkable period of cultural contacts in Western um, and Central Europe. Um, and obviously there were contacts before, but this really is of, of, a, of a different scale. Um, so, so beakers are found in, in graves and in Carmarthen, we, we here's the beaker pot I just showed you um, reconstructed after excavation. Um, we have a very early beaker grave that was found to up a loggy um, quarry in the Glen. Um, it, was, it was found during excavations prior to um, uh, gravel quarrying uh, expansion taking place in 2005 in a pit which specialists think might have been timber lined. And inside this pit were three pots um, and uh, two Irish um, flints. Um, this is, I haven't got a picture of all three pots together, I'm afraid, or the third pot because they're incredibly fragile and we need to send them off to um, the conservator to um, do a proper reconstruction. But the, the, Alison Sheridan, who studied the pots, she's a curator at the National Museum of Scotland. She's just retired as well, actually. Um, she determined these uh, pots to be of a kind made and used in the area, um, probably in the area that's now known as the Netherlands. Um, so not so much, um, uh, we're not sure whether they were made here, um, but certainly the people who made them would have had knowledge of um, the pottery styles that were, and the burial styles from um, the continent. This is common, uh, common, I say not common, particularly common, it's quite extraordinary actually, but the, the, the Beaker People Project has detected a number of individuals buried in early Beaker graves where the DNA and other scientific techniques were established and they came from the continent. Um, so it seems likely that the person buried at Apalagi also um, came from the continent. continent. Um, sorry, Ken, I'm just going to admit somebody else to the waiting room. She's been waiting a wee while. Um, so um, although we had no human remains in that grave and uh, objects found in the grave, it is the first piece of evidence we have of um, potential metal use in, in Carmarthen. And the links to, um, sorry, I'm showing this picture of this unassuming lump of stuff, which is actually, it's, um, it's a, um, a copper uh, or um, lump. Um, do we think that this, very tempting to, th to, to think that the group who came uh, here and one of whom would have died and been and buried in Carmarthen um, might have come to the already established ritual centre of Carmarthen looking for sources of copper. Um, there's, there, are, there is copper here. There's a, um, a mine um, c c quite close to the Ormeg rock art site as well. And as I've said in talks before, I wouldn't recommend going in this space because there's a, this is the 19th, uh, 18th century shaft of the copper mine and it leads to a very, very deep drop. And there's also um, super protected species of bats in there. Um, so I, I, would, I would avoid it if um, on health and safety and um, uh, natural heritage grounds. Um, so not, not long after the first copper artifacts were found in Britain, people were alloying copper um, and tin to produce bronze. Um, and that, that then for archeologists heralds the period um, that we call the Bronze Age. Um, now, just to give you a little flavor of um, how, you, how you make a bronze object, um, James and Emma, um, uh, James Dilley of Ancient Craft and Emma Jones have very kindly sent me some um, photos to give a series of um, images of how, how you make a bronze object. So this is James crushing the, um, the ore. Um, and then obviously you need to um, heat the ore um, to, to a, a temperature I can't remember, I'm afraid. Um, and then pouring, um, this is James pouring the ore into um, a stone mold. Um, so you can start to see that it's a, a flat axe that he's making. And this is it cooled um, and out of the mold. Um, and then that's the um, final hafted object. Um, so can you imagine, um, as I've said, this, this, this being able to transform these lumps of 
um, unassuming material into these amazing, sharp, shiny, dangerous, fabulous tools. Um, we think we, we think I know James um, maybe has is a little more prosaic about this, but we think we think this might have, that Bronze Age smiths might have been regarded as shamans as being able to do something magical, transformative with these materials. Um, but certainly, the artifacts that they made would have been regarded as high status artifacts for sure. Um, and if the metal was sourced from closer e e to the ritual centre of Kamati and Glen, these things might have been regarded as even more special. So um, there you go. That's that, that's um, another replica, um, which uh, because you. you they are making weapons as well as, well as um, axes, although I'm pretty sure that the axes might have been used as weapons as well, rather than um, just for, for chopping down trees. Um, so the um, early artifacts we, we had, we, the first artifact I, I want to show you is from um, early metal finds from in and around Ar Argyle. Um, this was, um, this, is a, this is what Trevor Carey, who looked at it in 2004-5, um, described as possibly a very worn flat axe or um, an ingot. Uh, it's, a, it's got a very, very high copper content. Um, and it was found by uh, Ewan McDougall um, near Tainold. Um, it's a metal detector find that came to us through Treasure Trove. Um, so it's, it's possible that this was a chance loss, um, but, but a lot of bronze objects are found uh, in groups in circumstances that have led uh, archaeologists to believe that they were deliberately deposited. Um, this is these are known as hoards. Now, I think in the modern the modern world we're quite familiar with the term hoarding as meaning the acquisition of stuff um, and the kind of. Um, uh, but in archaeological terms, um, the, sorry, archaeological yeah, the archaeological use of the term means the deliberate deposition of a group of artifacts in a in a significant place. Um, so the gathering together of things and then placing them it somewhere. Um, often these are um, boggy places, pools of water or places that have um, that might have been pools of water or boggy places in prehistory, um, but also places where there's um, significant landscape features as well. So prehistoric people might have understood these as boundaries between land and water, um, special places, and the artifacts are being put out of use um, beyond the reach of, of human hands, um, a form of ritual deposition. So people, are, uh, we, we think, are making votive offerings to gods, goddesses, or, or otherworldly beings um, as part of a, of a sacred practice, uh, religious belief, or um, conspicuous consumption, or, or all of those things together. Um, people are being able to, you know, in ethnographic um uh, accounts of uh, the potlatch ceremonies in North America where people are, are demonstrating their wealth and their power by being able to um, destroy um, vast um, amounts of really valuable and special items. Um, so apologies for that, but I, I can assure you that the one in the middle that's hidden by the other photo doesn't look very much different from the one on the right-hand side. Um, so this, these were three axes found um, in 1996 um, to... Uh, there was a metal detecting rally on the Ardkin Glass estate, which was um, attended by uh, people from Treasure Trove. And um, these axes were found very close to each other um, and, and excavated uh, by the... Um, unfortunately, we don't have um, any um, report because the person who did it has, has now left the Treasure Trove um, unit. But they were found um, at the head of the lock, uh, at Loch Fine. Uh, on the Ard King Gas Estate, and that is um, fairly for those of you that know the area. It's quite a spectacular place. Um, we did. There was no, unfortunately, no scientific dating uh, evidence recovered. But Matt um, Knight and Stuart Needham have, uh, who, as I've mentioned, Matt as a Bronze Age um, cu uh, curator at the National Museum, and Stuart Needham is also a Bronze Age specialist. So we were able to stylistically date these axes to around about 2200 um, to 200 BC. So that's the earliest bronze use in Britain and Ireland. Um, and to, to, two of them, um, they, they are actually still at the National Museum because um, Matt was uh, hoping to do some analysis to see if we can determine the source of copper um, because uh, the type of axis, certainly of two of them, suggests that they uh, are most often found in Ireland. So 
um, they may have come from Ireland, but what that suggests is that the people living in Argyle had a role in importing um, Irish metal into Scotland in the early Bronze Age. Um, so coming back to um, Kilmartin again, the, the Bronze Age is really a period where the Glen absolutely flourishes in, in terms of, the, of it becoming a, um, a ritual centre. Um, there's monument building going on and also the production, circulation and deposition of uh, amazingly beautiful high status artefacts. Um, people were, were adding particularly to the, to the ceremonial burial landscape with large numbers of, of burial cairns. Um, and they also created arguably what is the largest uh, monument in the Glen, um, the Linear Cemetery. So this is a Cairn cemetery of at least five Cairns, and there might be two, maybe even three more um, in, a, in a line that stretches up um, nearly two kilometres along the Glen floor. There's Nebelagi um, South uh, Chambered Cairn, which I showed you a picture of before, the Neolithic Chambered Cairn, was incorporated into this cemetery. Um, the, the builders... Um, made it in, it was trapezoid in its original form and it's been um, it has been made into to look more like a, a round cairn. Um, we think that the builders might have been trying to identify um, quite successfully, I should think, with um, earlier mythical ancestors and they're emphasizing their own power and status um, and through the construction of these ginormous burial cairns. And actually, um, just seeing this picture, there's a I don't know whether you can see my cursors, but there's another cairn right on top of the hill there, which is Canassery, which is really if, an absolutely spectacular, sorry, cairn barn on Canassery Farm, um, a ginormous and very spectacular cairn. So it li literally, um, landscape is, is littered with Bronze Age cairns. Um, and of course, it's it not, not only is it emphasising the status of the people buried there, it's also emphasising the status of the people who are, who are making these cairns. Um, Temple Woods also is is um, ad adapted uh, into into other other phases. Um, Ring Cairn uh, is constructed there with a with a central um, kist, and we're not certain, but at some point the stones of um, the other circle are dismantled and possibly used in um, other other monuments elsewhere. So at this time, we we we're sure that people living in Camarton. Um, there's definitely a, an, an elite here who are expressing um, status and identity through these massive burial cairns, through their wide ranging contacts um, and, and connections, as well as through artifacts. And it's very likely, people have speculated, it's very likely that the basis of their power and status is founded on them being able to control the supply of metal, as well as being able to link this to and harness the power of the Glen as a spiritual center. Um, I don't myself see it necessarily in purely economic terms either. I think um, we're, we in the Western world are quite good at separating out um, secular and spiritual um, aspects of life. But I think that people would have would have regarded um, the, the, um, the the movement of metal through the Glen as something that was a, um, a, a something that wasn't entirely um, economic. Um, so most of so some of you will know that antiquarians and later archaeologists have excavated quite a number of these monuments in the Glen, and we've um, found lots and lots of interesting information and artefacts. But no uh, prehistoric metal artefacts um, from Camarton Glen have survived to this day. Um, what we do have is um, evidence of um, metalworking. Uh, oh, sorry, evidence of metalworking comes in the form of. Um, images um, or of the tools themselves. So here, here you get to see the um, where I intended the, um, this picture to turn up. Um, so so uh, the dead were quite often placed into um, what's known as a kist, which is a stone-lined grave. Um, this is actually a kist that we excavated from uh, Canassery, complete with the, um, the pot still inside. Um, this particular kist didn't have a cairn over the top. Um, but in the linear cemetery, we have um, kiss burials in, inside, the, uh, which were covered over with cairn material. And this is the capstone from Netherlagi North. Um, so this, the carvings that you're looking at on the drawing here would have been facing the dead. 
And what we've got is a series of cut marks, um, but we've also got um, axe uh, carvings, the shapes of the shapes of copper or bronze flat axes, um, and overlaying um, onto the cut marks in some cases. Um, now this this stone has an incredibly complicated biography, uh, and it's been been studied by um, using photogrammetry, which is a, um, a technique that can produce these high resolution um, images that allow you to see a lot more about what's going on um, on the stone than with the naked eye. Um, and he and Professor Richard Bradley uh, are just about to publish an, an article on it because what they found um, is, is really a, a, um, basically stratigraphy in, in, in these um, carvings. So they've not all been done as part of one, one event. Um, the inner face of that kist as well was um, has two axe markings, uh, carvings on it as well. Um, so um, other cairns in the Linear Cemetery also have um, axe uh, marks. Netherlodge Mid um, had one that, that Mar Marianne Campbell, a local antiquarian, uh, and Mary Sanderman had identified, but um, various researchers had gone back and said um, they couldn't see it. Um, from she'd found it in the nineteen Marion Camp Marion found it in the nineteen sixties, but that's now been confirmed that it is an axe mark um, by Erin and um, and Richard. And during that piece of work, they also found um, the faint representation um, of a hafted weapon, um, which is the drawing is here, and that is the um, the the representation of it through photogrammetry. Actually, when you know it's there with the naked eye, you actually can see it. Um, it's not as glam glamorous as the um, deer carvings that were found at Duncrag Egg um, just, just recently. It was, it was found in the same, well, came to um, attention in the same year, but it unfortunately didn't re receive quite as much media attention as the Duncrag Egg deer. Um, so that really, that really did go viral. So carved representations of um, flat axes are, are very rare. Um, no other examples in Scotland. Um, and the nearest axe marks on a Bronze Age monument geographically um, to Carmarthen um, is actually on the, uh, oh, sorry, I should, I'll talk about this in a minute. Um, sorry, this is, this is um, uh, the other, this is from Raikouin, and this is uh, a halberd, so that's the bronze blade and then this would be the staff. Um, this is Stuart Needham and Trevor Cowie have done a lot of work on on this um, to tr to try to figure out what what it is, what it is. People have described it as a boat, um, but but again, it's got it's been the carving has been added to over time. But I should say this isn't the actual carving because that's been lost, uh, unfortunately. Um, I'm not sure when. But what this is is. Um, uh, a, a plaster cast that was made um, at some point, I think in the 1920s, uh, which, is, which is preserved in the National Museum and Stuart and Trevor were able to do their research using the plaster cast. Um, we're hoping to borrow this in the new museum as well. Um, Roy Kroon also has um, uh, flat axis uh, carvings and they are um, Irish style, which is very interesting. So this is um, the Roy Kroon um, slab with the, the axe markings, which are quite clear um, there. And Erin and Richard's work has detected more, more carvings than previously were thought. And here, here's a picture of um, Stonehenge uh, laser scanning with uh, um, axe shapes. And they are a different style um, of, of axe and they're very, very faint. Um, so the the um, it was it took a, it took a long time really I think laser scanning techniques um, were able to detect the um, axes at Stonehenge but it was long debated and a lot of people um, said they couldn't they couldn't see it but um, when the laser scan proved that yes they were there so it's it's clear that metal and metal artifacts have played a um, special role in the rich culture of Bronze Age life in Camartin Glen and their significance really is still being explored. Um, we think later in the Bronze Age, we have evidence that the climate began to worsen. Summers became um, wetter and um, cooler, um, and we start to see in Camartin uh, the, the um, expansion of the Moynivore peat bog um, 
So we think around this time, probably farming conditions, pastoralism conditions would have become a little less favourable. And around about the same time is when we see an intensification of the practice of depositing hoards of metal, um, possibly connected to a changing climate, um, although we don't obviously know exactly how quickly this happened. Um, so now I'm going to show you uh, a picture of, um, now then, this is the coal hoard. Um, so this is the most spectacular group of artefacts that we have in the museum, I think, as a, as a single deposit. Um, it was found by um, Kenny McIntyre, who's, a, who, who's not on coal anymore, actually, but he was living on coal, uh, working as a fisherman. Um, and he was a, um, had met, he was a metal detectorist by hobby. Um, he found this um, at the south end of the island. Uh, he found the first um, spearhead, um, this one here, which is the whole spearhead, which is really unusual. And he knew straight away that this was a find of some significance. So he got in touch with the treasure trove unit. Um, he'd done a metal detecting survey, so he, he had a, knew he had a lot of signals, but he'd put um, flags in where the signals were rather than digging the whole lot up. And the treasure trove unit, along with Trevor Carey, were able to go to coal and undertake um, an excavation. And I think because of that, we know an awful lot more about this hoard than we might have done otherwise. Um, it was awarded to the museum by treasure troves. There isn't a museum on coal. Um, and so we're the, the nearest museum. And uh, we had to raise about £10,000 to have the um, artefacts conserved. Uh, we did it crowdfunding and people were extremely generous. Um, and I'll show you a picture of, um, so this is what the artefacts look like pre-conservation. Um, and this, um, this is a, um, a, a sword hilt um, just coming out of the ground. Um, so um, once we were able to um, clean the, um, all the artifacts, we, we knew we had 13 pieces of bronze metal work. And this represented uh, at least, or oh, parts of at least two swords, five spearheads and fragment of what appears to be a socketed knife. Um, apart from that one intact spearhead, all the artifacts are incomplete. And we think this is almost certainly as a result of deliberate breakage in antiquity. These artifacts were being put out of use of human hands before they were deposited. Um, the excavation work was able to tell us that they were deposited. Um, I'm just admitting someone else there. Um, <laughs> deposited in a, a watery pool, um, which has which has subsequently dried up. Um, this and this sword, as you can see, shows the um, notches here. So it's it's been used in in combat, um, hitting to be hit hitting another sword basically. Um, so this is the um, you see the the three people um, there are standing on what might be a platform that might have been used to, um, as the launch spot for the artefacts to be deposited. And they were found in the, um, in the uh, flat area just here. So um, Matt um, has worked on, looked at the artefacts for us um, and his work uh, as a whole on Scottish um, uh, Bronze Age metalwork. So these artefacts might have been, been heated and then hammered before they were broken and, and thrown into um, the, the water. And you can imagine um, this it might have been kind of glowing red hot pieces of metal hitting the water, um, a, a kind of form of ritual killing of the artefacts. And can, can you imagine what that might have, have looked like? Um, so one of the other things that was really incredible and, and wouldn't possibly might not have survived if we hadn't have excavated, if these hadn't have been excavated by archaeologists, were that three of the um, spearheads were the sockets of which were found to contain preserved wood in situ. Um, and so this is directly related to the life use of the artifact, and it's incredibly rare. Um, the crowdfunding campaign actually raised more money than we needed to conserve the artifacts. So we were able to um, undertake analysis. Um, there's some of the wood. Um, uh, Dr. Susan Ramsey looked at the, the wood and was able to identify species. And um, two of the spearheads were um, ash, 
uh, which is which is a, has a long history of use for handles, shafts for tools and weapons because it's tough and flexible. Um, and the third was tentatively identified as hazel um, on, a, on a spearhead, but possibly that was used uh, because it might have um, had a long straight uh, growth pattern. Um, and Trevor, this is another piece of wood inside the spear um, there. Um, and we also, um, Trevor thought that he uh, could identify uh, refitting um, pieces of the sword. Erin um, and I tried this the other day, and this is this is my terrible photo. Um, you can see the, the blades are bent um, here, um, but Tr Trevor thought that these two pieces uh, refitted, and we're kind of tentatively thinking that, the, that this might, it might actually be a whole sword, um, but because the edges are quite damaged, it's not possible to necessarily for us to detect that. So um, we need to we need to get Matt back to have a look at them. Um, I think at some point. So, so of course, also um, the wood uh, allowed us to do some carbon dating, which is really really incredible. And Trevor had um, initially looked at the um, artifacts and dated them broadly to the late Bronze Age. So period around 1000 to 800 BC. But the um, carbon samples actually gave us a broader um, uh, range of dates. So the first um, two of the spearheads were probably 10th to 9th century BC, and then the third, um, 11th century BC. So we have a hoard here that's an accumulation of offerings over, over generations rather than just a one-off event, which is interesting and it reinforces that this cultural tradition is a, is a long-standing thing, not, not just um, one-off kind of deposition of artifacts. Um, okay. So um, closer to home, oh, here's Trevor studying the, um, the spears. Um, closer to home, we, we do have a hoard, a, si a similar um, hoard, but this is in the National Museum's collections. Um, so this is uh, the Torren hoard that was found on Loch side. And this again is a really interesting um, group of, um, of artifacts, spears, axes, socketed axes. Um, it's been suggested that it was a metal workers hall rather than a ritual deposition, because if you see um, there's casting floors on, on this one, and it wasn't necessarily found, and it was close to Loch side, but not necessarily in a pool itself. Although um, we, I, I think, Erin and I haven't discussed this and with various other people, we think probably knowing everything we do about Bronze Age people, it probably was um, uh, a ritual deposition rather than metal workers' hoards. Um, it's the, the site itself has a, a really prominent rock um, form and everything we know about them so it would suggest that. Um, I think this is, this, is actually, this is actually a replica, but this is one of only two, I think, two Bronze Age chisels or gouges um, found and the, the the real one was it we had this on display but the real one uh, was in the National Museum but we're hoping to get the whole hoard back um, for the new museum which would be brilliant. Um, so the last artifact I want to show you that's in our collections is um, this lovely sword um, and it's it was reported uh, by the Keeper of Antiquities as, as he was then known by the National Museum of Scotland um, in 1875 um, one of three swords which were found on the um, island of Shuna, um, which is um, here, for those of you that don't know, there's um, open. So it's a, um, a little island um, in, in the Inner Hebrides, lovely place to go. Um, it, one of the swords was presented to the National Museum uh, and one to Glasgow Museums and one to St Andrews Museums. Um, an Anderson's report of 1879 uh, says that they were, and I quote, found whilst digging a ditch through peaty soil within a short distance of each other, um, all sticking vertically at the peak with the points downwards as if they'd been designedly thrust in and not casually lost. Um, so that would must have been quite an exciting find. Um, and also the concept of ritual deposition, therefore, I think was recognised in the um, 1800s. Um, and here from the old museum interpretation board is a, is a, um, uh, a, ritual, uh, um, and a reconstruction of what that ritual might have looked like um, 
I, I suspect it might have been even more spectacular than that. Um, this is um, 20 years old, and I think thanks to the work of people like Matt and Trevor, we're starting to understand that the circumstances that these artefacts were deposited was much more complex than, than we might have imagined um, 20 years ago. Um, this is this is a replica of the Shuna sword, which actually is right behind me. I should have got it out of the box and waved it around. Um, and just to show you um, how shiny and dangerous it would have been when it was first made. Um, St Andrews uh, transferred the sword to Fife Museum some many years ago, and it was on loan to Camarton Museum. And when I contacted Fife uh, Museums to say um, we needed to return it with the museum being closed, um, they said, uh, would, would we like them to transfer title of the um, artifact to us? Um, and of course I said, yes. So um, this is coming into our um, collections um, very shortly and we will display it um, along with um, all of the artifacts I've shown you today, actually, in the, um, the new museum. So I'll finish there and just show you a picture of what we think the new museum is going to look like. Um, as um, Ken said, it's a seven and a half million pound project. And uh, I, I should say we're still fundraising. Um, if you want a bronze plaque, um, there's still chances to have a named plaque. Um, so you can just contact a member of the team um, if you're interested. Um, and just before I finish, I should just say um, a very big thank you to, um, to Ken uh, from the education team for organising the talk. Julia, um, our education team lead, would have been here, but she's not very well today. Um, also to Aaron for his um, letting us use his fantastic photos. Um, and to James and uh, James Dilly and Emma Jones from Ancient Craft as well for letting us use uh, great images. And um, especially to Trevor and to, um, to Matt, again, for being so generous with their knowledge. <laughs>